Well, hi. How's everybody doing? I'm okay. <laughs> I mean, the Jayhawks lost last night very badly, very poor showing. I am so sorry to everybody that watched that. Andrew and I went to the game. Who went to the game yesterday? Anybody? Yeah, it was a little cold, wasn't it? <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys so much uh, for being here today. So glad to be with you and um, in our new series called Relationships 101, Back to Basics. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I know Pastor uh, Alex introduced me, but my name is Dalton. I am the youth pastor here at Anchor Church, and I'm so glad to be up here and have the special honor to speak to you guys today. Um, we're you know, we're really excited about this uh, series. Uh, man, I, I know that uh, Pastor Luke and I and Alex and Chanel have been praying over this and talking about this for a couple months now. And so, yeah, we're just really excited about it. So uh, today I want to jump right into scripture. So if you could stand with me this morning as we read God's word, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 14, verses 8 through 16. So starting in verse 8, it says, Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bala, that is Zor, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sidim against Kador Laomer, king of Elam, Tidal king of Goyim, and Raphael king of Shinar, and Ariok king of Elasar. Four kings against five. Okay, who thought that was a lot of names? <laughs> now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot in his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot, his possessions, together with the men, or the women and the other people. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you. For this morning. God, thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, let today be a day that we get to learn more about relationships, more about you and your heart behind them. God, I pray that you would just continually speak into our hearts and bring transformation into our lives, God. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for standing with me as we read God's word this morning. This relationship between Abram and Lot, I find to be super cool. The story is really a great reminder of how friendship and relationships should be. I did some research on the topics of relationships. Who likes research? A couple of us? Some of us? Yeah. I love research. <laughs> um, so did you know that the rate of loneliness in the U.S. has increased from 11% in the 1980s to 40% back in the 2010s? And over the last decade, we can assume that that's just completely increased as well with the pandemic. I found this information from John Cassiopo, who is a psychologist. He specifically studies loneliness at the University of Chicago. And some sad statistics I read on this that some researchers from Brigham Young University, or BYU as some of you may know it, found after surveying 300,000 people over seven and a half years. I'm telling you, that is a massive research project. They found that loneliness creates health problems like Elevated stress, poor sleep, a 29% increase in the risk of heart disease, a 32% increase in the risk for stroke, cognitive decline, and even a reduced immune function. The saddest part of this research, the mortality risk associated with loneliness actually exceeds the risk associated with obesity and physical inactivity. And it's comparable to those associated with smoking. To put this plainly, those who deal with loneliness regularly are twice as likely to die early versus those who have consistent social interaction. I'm telling you today, those are some sad statistics for loneliness. Why are we so lonely? Why is loneliness increasing? 
I believe it's because we are replacing relationships with things that can't replace relationships. Starting with social media and our devices, we choose instead of going to get coffee with a friend that, eh, I could just send them a quick Facebook message. Instead of setting up a time to hang out with a friend, we text each other daily and never see each other. I am so guilty of that. Instead of setting up a time to go and create healthy relationships, we assume that all the people on our Facebook feed are our friends, right? Another thing that I've seen that we replace relationships with are our pets. And I promise this one hit me to my core. A survey done by Link AKC, a device company that works specifically with pets and their pet owners, found that 50% of Americans would choose their, pe their pets or their dogs over other people in their social interaction. 50%. It means over half of us in here that have pets would choose our pets over people. And don't get me wrong, I love dogs. I appreciate how they integrate into our families. You know, Summer and I had two dogs up until two months ago when one of ours passed away. And he, in my eyes, was one of the best dogs ever. It was amazing. It was one of my best buddies. I wanted to take him everywhere. Who feels that about their pets? They want to take them everywhere they go. Several of us. Our little dog at home is amazing. She's fun. She's loving, likes to cuddle. I've found myself in this exact situation before, wanting to hang with my dogs instead of people. It's a trap that we animal lovers fall into over and over again because, man, it's much more comfortable to stay at home. You may also feel some sort of responsibility to stay there because you don't want them getting into something or doing something they're not supposed to. I feel that a lot. Or you feel bad because you're walking out and they're staring at you with those puppy dog eyes like, please don't leave, every single time. But something that these statistics on loneliness and how we feel about our animals reemphasized to me was that we were created to do life together. Life wasn't meant to be done alone. God created us for life together. In Genesis 2, chapter, or chapter 2, Verse 18, it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. After creating man, even God knew that we couldn't live life by ourselves. He knew that we needed companionship. He knew that we needed someone to be there physically with us. That sense of having someone close and within reach was what God's heart was for us. God didn't want us by ourselves, so why do we continually find other ways to not be with our friends or our spouses? Here's the thing I appreciate about Abram and Lot. Abram knew that Lot couldn't escape by himself. He knew that Lot needed a friend. Abram was loyal, a good friend. So diving into this a bit more to understand why relationships are important, we're going to go back before chapter 14. I'm going to give you a little backstory. Just before war broke out, Abram and Lot had some disagreements going on between them. If you go back to chapter 13, you see that they had to separate because of disputes between Lot and Abram's herdsmen because their flocks were intermingling. And I'm not a farmer, so I don't know how much that really means, but I'm guessing it meant a whole lot to them. Because they were struggling to keep them separated with the land they were on, so they ended up separating their families into different parts of the region. Once they separated... This massive war just broke out in the region. Nine different kingdoms were fighting. That's a lot of kingdoms. The first five were rebelling against King Cater Laomer and his allies because those kingdoms had previously came in and took over their land. They ended up failing. And so the king's army went and took over Sodom and Gomorrah. This resulted in Lot being captured and all of his things being taken away. When Abram had heard about all this, he immediately got his army together and went after King Cater Laomer's army to get Lot back. The attack forced Cater Laomer's army to flee, and that helped Abram to be able to rescue Lot. Now, that right there is real friendship. Abram was bold, he wasn't scared of some big army. He was like, uh uh, that's my friend, I'm going to get him. And I want to note a couple things about this story. First, immediately after Abram heard about Lot being captured, 
He didn't sit there and try to write a message and have a carrier pigeon take it to him. He didn't just sit there and hope something was going to happen. Abram dropped what he was doing and went after him. He didn't weigh the costs. He knew what it took, and that is real friendship. Sometimes it's going to take jumping into the fire with someone. It's going to take running after them when they are running away from you. You've got to keep running, and you can't give up on people. Abram knew that and didn't hesitate. He knew that God was with him. Abram trusted God and his provision over his life so much that it didn't matter what awaited him. He was going. Abram could have very easily said no. Let me paint this picture for you. He and Lot, remember, they separated their families. They went separate ways because their families couldn't get along. Although Abram previously saved that relationship by coming up with this idea of separating into different parts of the region, he, could, he still could have left it there and been like, eh, I don't talk to him anymore. It's not worth it. But Abram knew how important Lot was to his life and his family's life. He knew that going to get Lot was what he had to do. The second thing I want to note is that Abram didn't just go at this alone. There's actually a couple things about this next part that I really find super cool. Abram didn't just go down to the National Guard and just was like, hey, I need some help. My uh, nephew has uh, been captured by some kingdoms. No, he picked up 318 trained soldiers that were a part of his family. People that he trusted to get the job done. People that he knew had some skin in the game. People that he knew wouldn't want to sit by and let Lot be captured. Abram picked the best and most trusted people around him to help. Abram knew he had a job to do and that he couldn't do it by himself. I mean, at the time, he was going to face one of the best militaries in the region. The army he was going to face for the last 12 years had ruled over the region. And they had just recently finished fighting off five different kingdoms trying to rebel against them. If you're a statistics guy, you're probably like, oh, that's not some good odds right there. I'm telling you, 318 guys against the best trained military in the region, I don't know. But here's the thing. Abram wasn't trying to win a war. He was just trying to get his friend back. They had the element of surprise, too. I find this hilarious. You think that anybody from King Cater Laomer's army suspected this random dude to come for a lot? They thought the war was over. They're probably sitting around the campfire singing campfire songs, right? <laughs> Hanging out. Abram trusted that God knew what he was doing. That the people that had trained up for war that he trusted would follow him into battle to get his nephew back. He, he believed that God would provide a miracle for them. And God not only provided a miracle, he went above and beyond in that miracle. His favor over Abram's life brought Lot back home, and they returned all the things that were taken from Lot's family. Everything was returned. Abram desired friendship so much that he was willing to sacrifice himself and his best men to save that relationship. He wasn't going to let Lot be alone in his circumstance. He wasn't going to allow loneliness to creep in. He stayed loyal. The title of today's message is The Loyal Friend. Are you willing to be like Abraham? He did what he had to do to be there for Lot. Are you willing to sacrifice everything to keep your relationships alive? To keep that spark going? To show that you really are a good friend? Are you willing to be there for your friends, for your spouses, for your kids, for your grandkids? Friends, being in relationships with people is tough, but it's worth it. Relationships you value will always have loyalty, always have loyalty. If you value your friendships and relationships, then you will stay loyal to them. Loyalty is a byproduct of your love and honor for someone else in a relationship. And if you love and honor them, then you will remain loyal without hesitation, just like Abram had with Lot. 
So what can we do to keep our relationships going? What can we do when creating new friendships? As we saw with Abram, he didn't hesitate. He went, right? As Christians, our answers should always be the same. Loyalty begins with our obedience. It begins with our obedience. As friends, husbands, wives, kids, grandparents, when someone you're close with is dealing with something in their life, then our response shouldn't be, ah, I'll help them later. Yeah, I'll reach out next week, see how they're doing then. No, it's jumping to our phones and reaching out to find out what's going on. It's going to their house and sitting with them as they deal with whatever their situation may be. It may mean even you got to take them to coffee, even if they don't want to leave their house. It may mean that you are taking them their favorite snack, even though they didn't realize they needed their favorite snack. Loyalty is showing up for people when it's hard, when it's inconvenient. It's showing up when, man, I really don't feel like being there right now. It's showing up for people when I feel like that person, they don't deserve it. It may mean even though it sounds good to stay at home with your pets and watch movies, and you go to see your friends. How are people going to know you're loyal? By saying yes, being obedient. It's not social media. It's not commenting on a status on Facebook or Instagram and saying, hey, Hope you get better. Are there good intentions behind what you comment on Facebook and Instagram? 100%. Not saying stop commenting. I think it's great. I think social media is one of the best ways for us to get to know each other, you know, in just an acquaintance way, I guess. But for relationships and building a friendship, you need to go that next step. Be there for your friends and your, and your spouses. Jesus was the one who showed up even when it was tough. He was there when, even when he could have been somewhere else. Loyalty is more than just showing up though, right? You got to stay committed. We genuinely have to accept that things aren't always going to go the way that we expect them to. Who's heard that before? Things aren't going to go the way you expect them to? Yeah. Same thing in relationships. We can't expect them to go one way and then it doesn't go that way and we're like, no, I'm good and I'm, I'm done right? And if all we're giving to people is one chance and that's it, that's not loyalty. Maybe they've messed up. Maybe they've been asking for forgiveness. Then that's something we should give them. Committing to someone as a friend, a family member, or a spouse, and that requires forgiveness. That's how we stay loyal. Man, really, like if Jesus only gave us one chance to make it right with him, none of us would be going to heaven, right? If we want an example of how committed and loyal we should be to our friendships, then we really need to follow Jesus' example of relationship with us. We consistently fail, and yet he is still there. He is still faithful. He never lets us go. His loyalty to us has created the standard for our relationships. So live your relationships and friendships through the lens that Christ does for us. With being loyal, committing to each other, forgiving as necessary. Another way we can build our relationships with others is by trusting others without hesitation. And I'm sure some of you are like, mm, I don't know about that, Pastor Dalton. That sounds a little, mm, I'm, not, I'm not good with that. <laughs> I want to stop here for a moment and say something, though. If you've had friendships or relationships who have continually abused or manipulated you, then this doesn't apply to those relationships. If you yourself have manipulated and abused relationships, then you cannot expect people to trust you. Trust is defined as a firm belief, a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability, or strength of someone or something. This definition of trust Reminds me a lot of faith. Faith is a belief, a firm belief. So if we are trusting someone, then we have faith in that person. If you hesitate to trust someone, then you probably don't trust them. It could be because you don't know them. 
Maybe they hurt you in some way before. Regardless, trust is difficult, right? Building trust requires time. How many of you would say trust is earned? You got to earn trust in my house. Yeah. But here's the thing is we need to trust people early and often. Why? Because our relationships suffer if we don't. Trust falls under the umbrella of loyalty. And if we say we are loyal to that person, we obviously trust them. Trust has to come as a way to show someone that you are there for them. Just like we talked about with loyalty, you build trust by showing up. Doing what you said you were going to do. Backing out of a commitment doesn't build trust with people. It's actually the exact opposite. Trust can be hard to build up but easy to break down. We allow small things in our friendships to hurt us. And they cause us to lose trust. What if that was reversed though? What if we began trusting immediately and made it difficult for us to not trust others? Kind of like our jobs have to when we first start them, right? They don't know you, but they're letting you trust. They're trusting you that you're going to get your job done. I'm not saying we be pushovers and allow people to steamroll us. I'm saying we follow the example of Abram. He trusted that God was going to provide. Trusting God is not like trusting people, though. God is good. Some people aren't good. Abram trusted that even though he and Lot had previously not had the best relationship in the conversation, that he would still be able to find him and bring him back. He trusted that Lot would even come with him regardless of what happened previously. You know, think of that story in the shoes of Lot himself. Trapped, most likely no idea what was going to happen, but hoping and trusting that his friends would show up. I assume that Lot trusted that Abraham, or Abram would bring him home safely. Some of us wouldn't even trust our best friends to do that. I know I would, but would I with some of the people maybe I'm acquaintances with? Probably not. This is where this is convicting to me. Being a friend, developing a relationship, it requires trust. It requires us to allow grace and forgiveness and love to someone else. So allow yourself to trust others easily. Begin by opening up. Be vulnerable early on. Show them you care by listening to them do the same to you. Trust will happen when we know that someone will help us walk through the tough stuff. That's why we start it early and often, to help develop our friendships and our relationships. And one last thing that I find to be an important aspect of relationships and building them is that honesty will advance your relationships forward. This one's going to be tough. Honesty will take your relationships to the next level. Hands down, one of the easiest ways to get your relationships going. It creates a bond between you and the other person. The bond of, man, I know something about that person that most people may not know. That person believes in me enough to tell me when I am wrong. Why is that? Because honesty is the one way that we can really show someone we care about them. Maybe you have a friend who you've really been wanting to talk to about something that's been bugging you. Maybe you have something you need to get off your chest or you've been dealing with that you need a friend for. Be honest, be open, be transparent with them. Your relationships will grow so much faster the more open and honest you are with others. We as Christians are representatives of Christ, right? That's what the definition of being a Christian is then that means that we have to be honest with each other. You didn't see Jesus just beating around the bush with the disciples, right? Honesty can help us to relate to others. You ever been honest with someone and they were like, hey, I've dealt with that too. Those are some of the best parts of relationship for me. I love being able to relate to people through honesty. The thing is, is once you've been honest, accountability begins. Part of honesty is accountability and vulnerability. Accountability is difficult, but it's a part of doing life with someone else. If someone you're close with is dealing with sin or dealing with something harming themselves or others, man, it is time to keep them accountable to that. Accountability is sometimes a daily or weekly thing that you have to be committed to. 
But I promise you, the more you keep someone accountable, the more your relationship with that person will grow. It's because you're honest with them. But here's the thing. We're really good about this, I know, as humans. You can't get offended if they keep you accountable, too. Your relationship should be reciprocating all of these things. Loyalty, honesty, trust, it should be reciprocated back to you. Your relationships depend on you being honest and open with people around you. If you can't be honest and vulnerable, then your relationships will be continued to be hindered by your pride. The thing that separates a relationship from becoming stronger is pride. Pride is a wall that we all put up because we don't want people knowing our junk. We don't want people judging us, looking at us differently. And the hardest part of all, we don't want to be held accountable for our actions. We would rather do life through social media and keep people at arm's length in person. That is pride getting in the way of you developing a relationship with someone else. Don't let pride hinder your relationships. Allow yourself to be honest and vulnerable with others. One thing I used to be good at was keeping people at arm's length. I'll be honest. I allowed my relationships to be pretty surface level because it was uncomfortable otherwise. Loyalty has never been hard for me. But I did have a hard time trusting and being honest with other people. I didn't want to change to be a part of my life. I didn't want to be transparent. So I was like, why be honest? I really didn't have a good track record for the people I had previously trusted, so why should I trust anybody else? All of this was how I felt until one day in college. It took one day for this to change for me. I realized I had been saying I was a Christian for far too long, but I didn't open up to anybody. First time I did was with a buddy of mine. We're sitting at a table at the Kansas Union up at KU having lunch. I'll never forget that because when I opened up for the first time about some struggles I had, he related to me said, man, I've been dealing with that same thing. Why don't we start keeping each other accountable for that? That began our friendship. It created some loyalty. It built that trust that he was going to be there for me when I needed it most. And really, at the end of the day, it helped me to see that I wasn't alone in all this. It took time to build that relationship, but it was worth it. It's going to take time to build your relationships. It won't happen just at the snap of a finger. It will take intentional steps to make sure you and your relationships grow. I'm sure every single person in this room has struggled with loneliness at least one point in your life. So why not go and show your friends that you were there for them? Why not go and be honest with them and trust them easily? We were created to do life together. We weren't created to do life alone. Core value of our church, don't do life alone. We have to be willing to open up and get out of our comfort zones though. We have to be willing to say enough is enough. I'm not sitting in my loneliness anymore. I'm not staying there. Because somebody else needs it. And I need it. You know, Pastor Alex has talked about this with us several times before. He told us we're either growing or we're regressing. We don't plateau in our faith. We don't plateau in our relationships. It doesn't stay the same. If you aren't growing, you're regressing somewhere. Our relationships have to be the same way. We can continue to build our relationships or we can continue to keep them at arm's length. Friends, today, choose your friendships. Today, choose your spouse. Today, choose your kids. They need you. They need to experience Jesus through you as well. 
Don't keep them at arm's length because you like to sit in the comfortable parts of your life. It's not worth it. Relationships are worth it. And that's what Jesus has told us. Relationship is worth it. Don't give up. Comfortable is the starting point. The ending point is Jesus. It's time to get uncomfortable with our relationships. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Some of you in here may have never experienced the love of Jesus. You're like, Pastor Dalton, I've, I've heard you talking about these relationships and how Jesus has this great relationship with us, but I've never, ever had that relationship before. I want to know what that's like. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of sitting by myself. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. down. We're going to pray today. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for the people who raised their hands this morning, God. The ones who admitted to you, God, that they need more of you in their life. Jesus, they don't want to do relationships by themselves. God, we want to do relationship together. God, I pray that you would bring an overwhelming healing to their life, bring peace into their hearts, God, rid them of their loneliness. Help them to get out of their comfortable positions of where they're at. Lord, help us to live uncomfortable in our relationships. In your name I pray.